Welcome to Homes and Estates for today and tomorrow. I'm so glad you can join us for conversations with top architects and designers. We're joined today by a horticulturist, in fact, one of the premier horticulturists in the United States. Philip Watson, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Philip, your work has an extraordinary range. You start by designing major estates, many owned by celebrities around the country. Your book, Pleasure Gardens, certainly makes clear your pleasure around gardens of any size, including smaller gardens. And you're a host on QVC, the shopping network. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about yourself, your work, and connect these three parts for us. Well, I have to tell you, I've always loved plants since I was about this tall. My great aunt had a flower shop that had a greenhouse behind it. And she showed me how to root chrysanthemums. And they rooted, and I thought, we've made plants out of sticks. I was hooked at that point. I love unusual plants. I like producing the plants, and I do think that a garden is about the plants. I, I think that it's important to have you know, sidewalks and things like that, but the garden is about the plants. And it's very personal. I love the gardening part. I'm always looking for something new. There's something new all the time. That's interesting, your comment about personal, because in your book you have these great tips. And one of the tips there is that you say a garden needs to reflect the personality of its owner. Yes. Tell me more about that. Well, I, I find that a lot of people think, well, we're going to have a beautiful showcase garden, which means that you're trying to appeal to the people who are riding by. You know, that curb appeal is certainly nice, but you're the one living at the house. When I come to visit the client for the first time, I tell them, I'm moving in. Really? Yes, because I want to stay in a bedroom. I want to look out the windows. I want to see which windows they look out. I want to see where they go out to have a drink in the evening, which way they go out in the morning, when they come home in the evening. Also, I want to question them about what times of the year are they at the house so I can make sure, okay, that time is really heavily beautiful at that time. You also say that loving your garden in the middle of the winter, in the worst part of February, is really important. Well, the winter is too long to be surrounded by ugliness. And True. winter itself is a beautiful time. And I use a lot of clipped forms. I design a lot of parterres, mm -hmm. and I'll have topiary forms. Because in the wintertime, when, even with a light frost, is on a perfectly clipped form, you can see it. It becomes absolutely magic. Don't expect to have flowers all winter. Even things that have berries in the winter or interesting bark, that gets a little bit ragged looking uh, before springtime comes. Clipped forms, if they're clipped properly, will look beautiful all winter long, and they are an extension of the architecture of the house. They have integrity. Um, I like to design the gardens where you have got a good balance between discipline and whimsy. It holds up, but it's got a sense of humor. You say we have to treat our gardens and prune our gardens like we give ourselves a haircut every six weeks. Well, e exactly, you know, unless you intend to have a Britney Spears moment in your garden, <laughs> which I don't advise. Um, <laughs> it's a little too harsh. But what will happen is that in the wintertime, say if we have as much snow this winter as we've had rain this summer, if things have been, not been properly clipped, they will not have formed in interlocking branches they will all splay open and fall apart and you cannot get the shape back. Things that have been clipped on a regular basis form interlocking branches. It doesn't budge in an ice storm, in a snowstorm. It's beautiful all winter. So do you recommend wrapping boxwoods, for example? I think that's always very ugly, but some people insist it's the only way to keep, get them through the winter. The really large boxwoods do need to be wrapped, but what I do is I wrap mine with netting. I don't wrap them with burlap. I, I use mm -hmm. the, the plain netting around it and then you don't see it. Um, smaller parterre boxwoods, those things don't need to be wrapped. If you just clip and clip and clip, you're not going to have those problems. And we do share our boxwoods every six weeks. And speaking of netting, that immediately brings to mind <laughs> our my wonder, number one nemesis, which is deer. Right. What is the solution for deer? Well. This is, I, I've got two types of clients. I've got the ones who want to have it all, which means that they're willing to put up deer fencing because you can have 50 different things or you can have 500 different things. And the difference is deer fencing. 
but there are more and more new varieties of plants that are coming out that are deer resistant. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more beautiful peonies. Uh, the deer do not eat the salvias. They're not interested in any of the different irises. Uh, there is a great annual called Agastache that is my favorite, favorite new plant because it looks like a perennial. So there are always new things coming out. Look at the old lists of the things that the deer don't eat and then try to find new varieties of those. Is it a myth that they do not touch roses or do they touch roses? They There's... will eat roses down to the ground including the thorns. Really? Even yes. the ones that are sort of the new variegated varieties where people say they kind of stay away from them? It's I don't myth. believe it for a minute. I think that the deer will go to that once they've eaten. I think they'll eat the roses they like the best first. Mm -hmm. They will get around to those. And what about the other comment I frequently get from other landscape architects, for example, milorganite. Feed them with milorganite and they will stay away. No, I don't believe it. Okay. I've tried it. I've tried all of those various you know, home remedies. And the, the thing is that there are so many interesting plants out there from which to choose. Like for an annual, like lantana, they're not going to eat that. A good rule of thumb, if the, if the plant, if the, if the, uh, the bloom or the, uh, if the foliage has a really sort of a, uh, an herby smell to it, mm -hmm. the deer generally don't eat herby smelling things. That's a good rule of thumb just to get you on the right uh, track with things. So like salvia, for example. They're not interested in the salvias at all. They're great perennial salvias. They're beautiful annual salvias that I use a great deal. Uh, <laughs> and they're, they're great perennials. There, there, there are plenty of things to use. Also the rule of thumb with just whether it's diseases or deer or having to spray things, if there's something that gives you trouble, don't have it unless it's an heirloom plant that was because your grandmother had it and you want to have it for that reason because invariably if the plant gives you trouble when you go out there you're not going out there to appreciate the plant you're going out there to see what's wrong with it so you've already started off on the wrong foot before you've even seen the plant <laughs> don't do it it's very encouraging that in your book you say you, it's okay to make mistakes yeah. it's a process it's the process and some of the, some of the greatest successes come out of making mistakes and you don't give up on the plant altogether. You may have cited it improperly. Mm -hmm. You may have uh, gotten a, a poor specimen. There may have been a waterlogged situation at the time. Um, so I'm always trying new things. I'm not going to be thwarted. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad gardener. I think that there are gardeners uh, who are not willing to accept defeat. And defeat's OK. You'll get some good successes in there, too. Good. That's very encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I've had my series of defeat, I will say. <laughs> right. And, and, it's, and it's not all your fault. And, uh, but I encourage people when I'm on air at QVC, I say, you know, you may not know about, know about this plant, you may not know about that plant, but try something new every year. It's like a diet. You know, try a new food that you've never had before. It may be your favorite thing rather than eating meat and potatoes until you drop dead. There are <laughs> lots of great things out there in the plant world, too. That's, that's very, very encouraging and very good news. I've struggled with planters, for example, over yeah. the years. And okay. tell me what, what I was doing wrong. They were well, driving me nuts I'll just tell you, the, the number one mistake that people make with planters is they choose planters that are too small. And so you've got to, oh, I've got to water them after breakfast. And then, oh, I've got to water them again after lunch. Oh, I've got to water them again before I go to bed. It's like a baby. Don't do it. Get a nice large container, one that's not going to fall apart in the wintertime, because mm -hmm. I like to leave mine out plant them with other things and you don't have to spend a lot of money on it. If you've got an ugly container, things can spill over the side and hide the ugliness. Mm -hmm. uh, those sorts of things. But choosing the right size pot. Also, uh, if you live in an area where you can't water a lot, mulch it. Um, choose things like um, lantana, uh, portulaca, sedums, things that don't take a lot of water. Um, and I, I think you, you'll find that it's a lot of fun. You've got to choose the right plant, the right pot. Good. I, I think I have to make some changes. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. If it'll fit in the pot, do it. I'll try it. It'll be my <laughs> experiment for next year. All right. <laughs> and uh, the other thing that I find fascinating, when I, especially when you visit somebody else's garden, is you yes. want to peruse through it. So walkways, yes. in a way, become a really important part. They're critical because a lot of people put in walkways um, as if they were never going to be older than four years old because they look like they're designed for children. And then you don't take into 
consideration that plants will encroach on the edges. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's going through a garden, that's what happens. You have to allow enough room for a walkway for encroachment. It's different from one that just has lawn that goes up to it. If there's a garden that goes up to it, the walkway needs to be four and a half feet wide, mm -hmm. not three feet wide. You've got to leave room for that. You don't want to play hopscotch through the garden. You want to be able to, to look at the flowers as opposed to having to watch your feet to make sure you don't fall down. Um, also, there are interesting paving patterns. There are loose things where you can plant uh, plants between the things where the, the walkway actually becomes part of the garden. It's a living walkway. I remember distinctly walking on a walkway that had thyme, I believe it was, uh -huh. planted. And the smell comes and up. And the smell. Every right. time you stepped on something, you f had the fragrance came up. It was just a delightful experience. To this day, I remember it, obviously. Oh, and that's it. it. It The things that smell really nice, they connect here. You can smell certain flowers, and you'll remember your grandmother. All those exactly. things are really, really important. But back to those walkways, uh, if you've got any time, likes a well-drained soil. Mm -hmm. Some walkways tend to be a little bit wet. There's a plant called Lysimachia, mm -hmm. or Golden Creeping Jenny, that works in shade and in wet areas. So there's the right plant for everything. It, just because time won't work for you in a certain situation doesn't mean that something else won't. You have to look. That's the skill of a horticulturist, for sure. I mean, this is a lot of interesting study, uh, uh, part of the process. And really. it's, all, it's about observations. I find if uh, people think, uh, well, my garden is really weak in August, or my garden is really weak in June, what you should do is go to beautiful gardens that are in your area. See what's going on. Mm -hmm. That'll help you a lot. The big mistake to make for someone who's not a really good gardener is to go to a garden center and try to solve their problems. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Bad, bad idea. That's like going to the pharmacy without a prescription and just picking something off the shelf and thinking, oh, I think I'll cure myself. How interesting. I hadn't even thought about that. But uh, because the garden centers are pushing all sorts of plants, a lot of times you know, it'll be something that is marginal for the area. They push the zone a little bit. Um, they're not going to give you the whole thing. But if you go to a, a landscaped area that's established, you'll see things, okay, that's blooming in August, I need that. This is beautifully uh, looking gorgeous in, in September. Mm -hmm. I, I think I need that for my garden. And make your, go pick your plants out in the proper garden, then go to the garden center with your list. Interesting, how do you think about color? Do you get requests if I want a certain color palette in my garden? This is what I, I asked him, I said, is there anything that you hate? Hate. Okay. Right, because that's generally a shorter list. <laughs> and then it allows me a lot of leeway. I can do pretty well what I want then. And my main job is is to uh, present the client with a really good plan that, that satisfies them and to make them love it. I can't say, well, we're going to have this just because I like it. Mm -hmm. um, you have to sell them on it. And you have to you have to have comparisons, you have to have illusions. I, I just did some plantings for a client where I, did, I mixed hot pink and red together in even amounts, in an annual, in a parterre. And they were like, I don't know. I said, it's beautiful. I said, look at such and such painting by Matisse. Ah. It'll be just fabulous. And, uh, but I, I get a lot of ideas by looking at painters' works. Mm -hmm. Not so much the form, but for the combinations of color, because they will use things, and you'll see it in fabric design too. Mm -hmm. Colors that normally don't go together in the right amount. It's like the proper recipe. It sings, and it sings a lot louder than, say, blue and pink being so perfect together, or navy and white. Uh, they're, they're better things than that. That's really interesting. So you really can tweak it to, I mean, with annuals, you have the opportunity, if you don't like it as much as you thought you would, you change it next year. But it's nice to sort of experiment a little bit, too. You can absolutely tweak it. And, and back to the thing about the annuals, too, is that anybody who thinks that they can have a beautiful garden with just perennials is sadly mistaken. Ah. You've got to have some annuals uh, to push the season through. And I don't mean throwing in geraniums and marigolds and zinnias and things like that that are obvious annuals. There are a lot of annuals out there that look like perennials. That's the trick, is don't throw in something that's obviously came from one of the box stores and is something that your grandmother grew in a pot 
40 years ago. Hmm. Um, you got to mix it up nicely and, and fool the eye. The annuals will bloom all season long. Most perennials have a short window, mm -hmm. although there are new ones now that have extended blooming times and some that are called rebloomers. Even like bearded iris, they're the rebloomers that bloom in the spring. Then in the fall, they do just as big as they did in the spring. Mm -hmm. Daylilies, same deal with that. There are always things that are doing more than the old fashioned ones did. Do you play around at all with uh, wild gardens versus more formal gardens? I'll do a bit. Um, I, I will use some of the, uh, the less invasive ornamental grasses. I'll, I'll use some of the looser uh, Rudbeckias or Black-Eyed Susans. Then I'll throw in some compact things with them. I'll have the wild things in the back and then graduate it down. You can generally say with a regular Black-Eyed Susan, if you've got that wild meadow look mm -hmm. in the back, mm -hmm. there are gradients within that genus of things that look like the Black-Eyed Susan, but they gradually get more and more compact, which means you can bring it down, like having tall salvias, medium salvias, and low salvias to bring it all down. Um, so you don't want it leggy. I don't like the leggy look, but you can have the leggy things to the back as long as you dress the front. I would think it also depends on your, to your point earlier, you, you live with your clients for, but when you first start out because you want to know if they're up on a terrace looking down on something yes. or are they at eye level with something else. Right. All, all those things are really important and also when I come I make sure that they have time for me to walk around the garden because the more they love the garden, the better the garden's going to be because they will, I, they'll, they'll pick out things that I've done and they'll say, well, I really love this particular thing. And I'm thinking, you know, there are three other varieties of that that we might want to play with and find out why they love those things. And it just becomes more and more personal every season that I work on it. Mm -hmm. The first year, it's kind of personal. I've done the best that I can. And then as I get to know them better, your relationship gets better, and then the garden gets better as a result. Do you ever find gardeners or, or owners saying, I would love a beautiful garden, but not so much work. Yeah, I do. I do. And there are lower maintenance things. I find that um, used to be you know, low maintenance gardens meant, you know, beds of pachysandra and beds of ivy and hostas, and mm -hmm. it was boring. <laughs> but even with hostas now, there are some that are just straight up chartreuse and just electric that have beautiful white blooms that come on late in the season. Mm -hmm. So again, there are new varieties of that. Even in Pachysandra, there's a fairly recent Pachysandra that's come out called Green Sheen. And it looks like it's had leaf polish done on it. Just glossy as a philodendron and evergreen. Wow. So those are those sorts of things. Uh, but again, to the low maintenance gardens is that they are uh, expensive to put in. Mm -hmm. um, they're less expensive to maintain, but on the front end, they're more expensive than a high maintenance garden. Because high maintenance gardens have got to be deadheaded because you can have more blooms coming up. Uh, a low maintenance garden is more about the foliage, and you have to put in the dwarf plants that are almost at mature size mm -hmm. because they're slow growing. A higher maintenance garden, you can have larger things that you keep clipping back. Um, but uh, a dwarf plant, like a dwarf Japanese maple, is a lot more expensive than, say, a full-size uh, Japanese maple. One of my um, follies in gardening is topiaries. Yeah. And so, you know, what we normally do, we go online and we Google around, and uh, I could not find a really large size topiary frame. Right. Help me out. Well, what I have, I have done sketching on paper before. Uh, and I have had welders do the hard parts, and then I have actually done a wire frame around it. I can mold it myself. Mm -hmm. As far as finding big ones yourself, it is very difficult. The, find, the ones that you find that are ready-made look like the topiaries that you would buy. Yeah. Why grow what you can buy? Mm -hmm. It's like, why grow better boy tomatoes? <laughs> you know, <laughs> grow an heirloom tomato. Um, so it, but if you feel adept at making your own framing for it, then uh, that's what I'd advise because basically the frame is not forming the topiary, it's guiding the clipping. That's it. It's not the form itself. It just guides you. And are there certain plants that do better than others? Um, in Greenwich, I, I typically uh, have used boxwood. It's slow um, because the deer are not interested in it. Um, it has a really nice look. Uh, in England and in Europe, other parts of Europe, you'll see um, 
taxes or U Y E W mm -hmm. um, primarily for the topiary, but the deer love it. They will absolutely eat it up. It does make beautiful topiary, but I, I tend to use the boxwood here. It's slow. Um, I've got a topiary collection myself. It's all in containers. So mine are in uh -huh. large pots. Uh -huh. And I do enjoy going out and trimming them myself. It's, uh, you know, women knit, guys make their topiaries. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but I, I do like that. And I get my little special scissors to do that. And it really, it, it feels good. You know, I'll, I'll trim it in the morning. I've got them out on the front porch. And it really adds to the curb appeal. A few clipped forms in your garden make it look like you have just worked yourself down to the bone. Good. And everything else can, you can have weeds everywhere else, <laughs> but if you've got a few perfectly clipped things, nobody notices that. I mean, those weeds are probably going to bloom at some point. That's what they're thinking. <laughs> That's a cool thing. I will remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the idea of guiding the eye is always a really important thing. Whether it's in architecture or in gardening, it's the same principle in a way. You want to guide the viewer along a storyline in, in a way. You do, and I find with, with the clipped forms and the uh, plants treated as architecture, when I mean like your hedges, use a level. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's absolutely plumb. Have right angles if that's what you're looking at. Have perfect cones if that's what you're looking for. Um, you don't want your garden to look like a tumble-down house. Mm -hmm. um, you also, it you know, extends to the furniture that you have in your garden. You know, the views outside should reflect what's going on inside. I mean, it doesn't mean you've got mahogany lawn furniture, um, but you don't have white plastic chairs outside the great room either. You know, bring them out for, for the wedding when you've got 300 people over there, but not for your few intimate friends. Right. But I've noticed in photographs but what shows up in garden photographs are patterns, and it can be a clipped form, it can be a paving pattern, it can be a trellis uh, form, those sorts of things. And Rosemary Veery, who was a great English garden designer uh, for years, was my mentor. Mm -hmm. And I spent uh, many, many days with her in England, and she was hard as nails on me, and she said, you have to design a garden as if you were looking through the lens of a camera. If you can't photograph it, it will never get published, and if it never gets published, you will never have a chance to be famous. Well said. And then she proceeded to introduce me to all the garden writers, the garden photographers, and all that was important. But aside from having it published, if you're just a gardener who wants to have a beautiful garden, pretty much what the camera catches is what you catch in your field of vision. Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be something really interesting. It doesn't have to be something that's right in your face all the time. There doesn't have to be something on axis at every turn. But there should be something interesting. And I find that patterned things show up. Just page through a magazine. Your eye will always stop on some pattern. Things that are just warm and fuzzy, that's pretty, but you don't remember it. Terrace is another really difficult part of a, of a landscape to get right, yes. I think. They, the scale has to be right, the plant material has to be right, the use of the terrace depends on each owner. Correct. Uh, I wonder if you had any tips there in terms of how you bring in, you want to, I always think of plant material on a terrace to soften the terrace. Yes. And uh, that's not an easy thing to do. No, it's not easy and um, you don't want it to look like um, some of the track housing that you see going in where they stuck a house in where it doesn't fit the lay of the land. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like a shoe that doesn't fit right. Mm -hmm. um, when I was designing a project uh, in Greenwich, um, it was a beautiful old home that had been properly situated along a ridge. They added onto the back of the house, which pushed the house a little bit further out onto the ridge, and you felt like when you walked out the door that you were going to fall down the hill because mm -hmm. it did, there was a great swale there. And I wanted to put a terrace out there so I went upstairs. I, again, I was staying with the client, and I, I went upstairs. I saw where the sun came up. I saw where the sun went down, and I shot, saw where the shadows fell. The shadows showed me the contour of the land, and then I had the guys lay out the terrace along that shadow line. How interesting. And that's what we did. We laid it out. We filled in with it, and then I used rough stone that we had gotten off of the property, and I planted you could do Boston Ivy or Virginia Creeper or anything, but I planted that in the stone. So you didn't see all that rough stone. 
you actually had a green terrace. So it appeared to roll as opposed to have a 90 degree angle. It rolled over, which was very soft. Then we cut in wide stone steps to go down. I added perennials to it. I threw in some barberries. Uh, the deer are not interested in that. We had uh, Amsonia for perennials, a, lo a lot of things to soften it that changed as the seasons went by. But um, the, uh, the client had an architect, uh, which I, I'm a horticulturist. I'm not a landscape architect, but I do enjoy working with architects, uh, particularly if neither one of us are too vain. <laughs> uh, because we can, in our, in our fields, we can both be extremely vain and a horticulturist can think that he can design all the walls and a, an architect a, or landscape architect can think that he can pick all the plants. There needs to be a happy marriage mm -hmm. and uh, to get along uh, and to, to do the best job. I, I so agree because sometimes in the, the, the challenge in construction really is to bring different trades and different expertise together into, into an environment that everybody really contributes their best thoughts and their best ideas and make them come together in a harmonious way. That's a challenge. It is a challenge because most people who are uh, really artistic they are so like this, they don't want to hear anything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. um, but the ones that do the best, I think, are, are the ones that bring in someone into the area where they don't know. And what I do is I'll do my drawings for the client. I'll say, the, here, here are the aesthetic drawings. This is the way the pool house is going to look. These are the dimensions. You make it work. <laughs> and I'll tell, I, I know how big I want the windows to be. Um, you know that what standard, and, and the trick is you have to really watch, watch them too because they think, oh, we're going to make a lot of money because he's specifying something that we're going to have to custom make. Well, you don't have to go that route. Right. So, I, and I made some of those mistakes in the beginning. Then I started I'm figuring out, you know, what is standard and we can make that look unique also. But that's very interesting that you really think about scale. The scale is everything. And uh, you don't see it much in modern architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, all that got thrown out the window. And I think when people became, had less property, uh, you could bunch things up together and everything was so bad that it didn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Your next door neighbors looked worse than yours did. Uh, but if you look at uh, proper proportion, and I love looking at Palladian architecture because I think it's beautiful, proper proportion. And one of the, the uh, projects that I did in Greenwich uh, is perfectly balanced. And uh, they called me in to look at the house. It was a new house before they bought it. And they said, what do you think? Do you think we can have a great garden here? And I said, absolutely. You can have Versailles type balanced parterres here. And uh, then about uh, three months later, they called me. They had bought the house and they said, we're at Versailles. We like this. Proceed. Wonderful. <laughs> so That's a really cool thought to end with. I, I have learned so much. Thank you. And I'm sitting here thinking, having my wheels turning, if you haven't heard them turning, but they were turning, thinking about what I need to take back to my own garden and really sort of revisit it from a completely different perspective. So I thank you so much for all of that. Thanks. Greenwich is my playground, and I'm thankful to be in Connecticut. To our viewers, thank you for joining us and I hope you will visit with us again for our next show with more conversations with architects and designers. For a recast of this show, please go to sabineshome.com, like us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, and signing off for now, this is Sabine of sabineshome.com. So long. Thank you. <laughs>